Well, hello everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and I want to welcome you back to a continuation uh, of this uh, series that uh, we are basically going through myself and Dr. J by putting all the material together for you to help you now glean uh, uh, resources and tools that will be helpful to you when it comes to the uh, Islamic, uh, basically, history and the critique of that, the origins of Islam, uh, the critique of the place, uh, the critique of the man, the critique of the book. And uh, as a result of this, of course, we're trying to do it in a way that uh, not only unpacks all of that material that has been covered multiple times already uh, with, with great uh, in-depth and expansion, uh, either on Fonder Films or at least on my own channel. But today we want to try to simplify it to where we're making it shorter videos and with really succinct focus on these topics as well. Today we're going to talk about the problem with the sources and uh, why is that crucial when it comes to the standard Islamic narrative. Again, with me here in studios as uh, before is our dear brother, Dr. J. Smith. Dr. J., welcome back. Thank you. Thanks what are the me. problems? with the sources that you want us to unpack here? Well, the first problem is the dates. Now, Al-Fadi, you're told that Islam began at this place by this man over this period with right. these people. And you're told this since you're knee-high to a grasshopper. Absolutely. And as you heard this there in Saudi Arabia where you grew up, you assumed that everything you were just listening to was sacrosanct, was true, right? That's correct, and it's supported by the evidence that presented to us. The tarikh, and, you know, the hadith, you know, the tafsir, you know, uh, you name it. Okay, and what, when you heard this as a boy growing up, uh, did you ever question where this material was coming from? Not at all. I mean, in my case, at least, and I can speak for many, not at all. Did your teachers ever tell you where it's coming from? N uh, no, it's just Islamic sources, and you don't question that. Oh, they did. They did tell you. They tell you, tell I mean, you. the source, at least, yes, but... Uh, do what were the question? sources they gave you? Well, of course, you have the Sira. Okay, and by who? Uh, Ibn Hisham, of course, because okay. that's the most popular one. We know about Ibn Ishaq, but Ibn Hisham basically... Actually, they would never one. said Ibn Hisham. They would have said Ibn Ishaq. That is true, but we knew that it was Ibn Hisham uh, because of the connection, at least that perceived connection between Ibn Hisham and Ibn Ishaq. Then you have the Tafsir, of course. You have the Hadith, Bukhari, Muslim, of course, mentioned all So the you time. knew these names. These are household yeah, names. Absolutely. Okay, and so you've grown up with these names. Yeah, like every, like every Muslim. Even till this day, by the way, these names are still household names. Absolutely. Now, for those of you who are listening, especially if you're a Westerner, you haven't heard these names before. These are probably new for you, but they're not new for uh, Al-Fadi. And that's why I want to make sure Al-Fadi, I'm just going to be throwing things at you as we go on. So these people, Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq, Al-Buhari, Sahib Muslim, I mean, they, they just drip out. Al-Tabari, these are names that you've grown up with. These are people that you have always heard. When did you think they lived? Well, I mean, of course, uh, let's take Ibn Abbas, for instance, as the father of tafsir or mm -hmm. commentary. I mean, Ibn Abbas is a cousin of Muhammad. So he would be living at the time of Muhammad. Exactly. Okay. And, and uh, where is his book? Uh, well, <laughs> that's the question. You know, you know about his book. Uh, From whom? But, uh, but you do not know. Where, where do you is know him? about Ibn Abbas? Where do you get all the material about Ibn Abbas? There's no book that he wrote. I mean, just tafsir, basically. And who is the person that wrote the tafsir? Al-Tabri. So we know about Ibn Abbas because of Al-Tabari. It's Al-Tabari Al that makes references to him all the time. Yeah. All the time. And so that's why we know about this man. And we know about Fatima, the daughter. We know about Aisha, the wife. I'm sorry, the, the wives. Uh, we know about all these stories about Muhammad. We know about the, the Ansar who were there in Medina. All these stories surrounding Muhammad's life, about the Medina going back and forth, the Hijrah. All these stories you knew about. And you always assumed that they were being written by people who were there. You have no reason to question it. And you never raised your hand in class and say, well, hold on a minute. Uh, oh, no, trust me, if I did that, uh, I think I would have suffered a great deal of persecution, not just by the teacher, but even my, by my parents, because they will be told that your son is questioning Islam. Okay, okay, that's Saudi Arabia, that's the environment. But see, in the West, where I come from, these haven't been questioned either. Mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me. There's no persecution. No one would throw you out of class or, to, or call your parents in if you were to ask a simple question at any university or any school where you're being taught this. Hold on a minute. 
where did these people get this material from? Now, that's interesting to me. Why? Because I noticed the same thing in the West also. It is not questioned. It's never questioned because there are no red lines in the West. We don't have censorship of, in fact, we engender and we engage people to question. That's what you do when you go to school. You go to school to learn, but you're also there to question the teacher. If you don't question the teacher, if you have doubts, then what kind of education is that? So we have a whole different concept of education here in the West than I would say you probably had in Saudi Arabia. So I'm even question. I'm even wondering why this has never been questioned in my upbringing, because when I was told this, listen, I was told this when I was living in India, uh, that uh, Ibn Hisham and Al Ibn Ishaq and Al Buhari, I knew these names. I grew up amongst Muslims all my life. I had them as classmates. I had them as roommates. So where I grew up in Northern India, which has around 200 million Muslims, some of the most radical Muslims come from where I grew up, up in the North part of India, Uttar Pradesh is what it's called. I, even they, we at least discuss these kind of things, but I don't remember ever myself asking the very, probably the most important question, where did you get all this material from? And I remember telling us a story that when you were at least doing your MA, uh, that when the professor was questioning things like this, the Muslim students left the class. Well, this was in London. This is yeah. much later. This is when I was actually, I had already got my master's degree. I had two master's degree. I had come to London. I was there in 19... 1994. Look at the dates. We're talking, what, 20, 25, 26, 27 years ago. I was there in class with Dr. Gerald Hotting. And I remember sitting in class on the origins of Islam, this very subject that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So that was 27 years ago. Dr. Gerald Hotting was part of the revisionist school. And he uh, was introducing some new, brand new material. There were maybe about 50 students in the class. And he started s saying simple things like, we can't find any uh, any mosque that has directed its Qibla towards Mecca. And I raised my hand immediately and I said, hold on a minute, whoa, whoa, wait, wait a minute. No early Qibla is facing Mecca? That's hugely significant. Why is that? And he would not answer. And then he said something like, the Dome of the Rock, you notice the Dome of the Rock doesn't have a Qibla. I said, the third holiest shrine in Islam doesn't have a Qibla. And I raised my hand. And as he was saying this, he was looking at the other students because the other students, about half the class was made up of Muslim students because this is on the origins of Islam. They were going to look and think, they were, thought they were going to hear what they've always been told. And they wanted to learn all this, all this material from Ibn Hisham and Al-Buhari and Sahim. They were coming to hear that. And yet they were hearing some questions about the origins of Islam, some historical questions. And one after another, in the, in the first two weeks of the course, one after another of these Muslim students got up, took his books, went to the door, said something really demeaning about the professor, Hotting, slammed the door and left and refused to take the class. And within two weeks, half his class had gone, all of the Muslim students. And I looked around as each one of them were leaving. And I said, goodness sakes, look how they're reacting. This is amazing. Yeah. I said, this... I never heard this material before. See, I, I had a master's degree in Islam from Fuller Seminary there in California. I had, uh, you know, uh, I spent my whole life study, learning about Islam. And uh, I, I was there studying under Dr. Dudley Woodbury, who is one of the foremost authorities on Islam in the Western world. And he never told me this stuff. He never told me anything about the historical critical uh, uh, material. I never heard this about the Qiblas or I never heard this about the sources, about the sources especially. That was the most damaging material. And here are all these Muslim students leaving the class. And I said, this is important. Source material is important because they were hearing for the first time that everything they had believed, everything they knew about Muhammad, everything they knew about what he did, everything they knew about what he said was not from the seventh century. So when was it from? Right. See, and the, you had never questioned this, had you? Not at all, not at all. And like I, like I said, right now I'm fascinated by this uh, simply because this is the foundation that Islam stands on. And what we're doing, brother, is we're taking a sledgehammer and we are destroying it. And by the time you finish destroying it, my question to my Muslim friends, what are you standing on? What are you standing on? If your very foundation is shaky and you cannot find a single evidence to back up the dates of this early start of this religion, the standard Islamic narrative, allegedly. This is why this is fascinating to me. 
Well, it, to me, this is, you, we have to start with the sources. We have to start with this problem because everything is dependent on these people who wrote about this man doing these things in that place. The book of the man in the place, these people who are the witnesses of these events should have been eyewitnesses. I'm guessing they are eyewitnesses. You have always assumed that these were eyewitnesses. That's true. That's true. We've demanded this of Christianity, haven't we? Yeah. We've demanded that Matthew and at least John, who were eyewitnesses to everything they wrote, Luke and Mark got it from the other eyewitnesses. They were actually people who lived there and heard it or saw what they were writing. So that we have passed that test of source criticism with Christianity. Now we're going to ask the same question of Islam. And that's what we're going to do with starting with the next episode. So what are we going to show next time uh, for people to uh, basically um, begin to learn why the sources are extremely important? I'm going to do what Muslims have not done and what you have never heard and what I hadn't heard. I'm going to put it on a timeline. Wonderful. I'm going to show you on the time. I'm going to show a few timelines. I'm going to show you exactly where the problem is. Thank you. Of course, uh, uh, to those of you who are watching this, uh, most likely this part alone, uh, which is the problem with the sources, might be multi-parts, by the way. So we're going to call this one part one. We'll see uh, uh, basically how many parts it will require for us to unpack. But we're taking our sweet time because we want to make sure we do not rush into just uh, lumping everything together because we want you to have these resources in a way uh, that is at least chronological from our perspective uh, that will be helpful to you, hopefully in a logical manner. But you can use it however you want. You can download it. Uh, you can uh, share it with others and, uh, uh, you know, basically take whatever portions you feel like are appropriate for your conversations that you're having with Muslims. If you're a Muslim watching this, we really welcome your comments. If you have a single source that can contradict anything we're saying, please send it our way. We're waiting for that 7th century source to back up any of the standard Islamic narrative. So far, I haven't seen any. And until next time, have a blessed day.